This will be our 13th message in this series on the table of the Lord. <clears throat> it's good to remember as what I call a principle when we come together, that the more closely our actions are related to what God is doing through Christ, the more God is involved in them. Now you can bank on God to do this. When your mind is set on him, his mind is set on you. Amen. When you're mindful of what he has done, he's mindful of what you're doing. Amen. And there's a, there's a fellowship and a, an accord, concord even, that happens, particularly at this table. Now the success of what we're doing <clears throat> that is the results that come from it, favorable results that come from it, must be considered in the light of what God's doing. We can't, uh, I know we know this, but it's good to s mention it. We can't become absorbed with ourselves when we meet. That's a good way to put God like at a distance. Yeah. So I want to underscore this because, because this table is something that we do, something we participate in. Good to keep these things in mind. Our text, it was a rather solemn text. So it's a rather, rather solemn text. And it means a lot more than what you think on this. You read through the surface. When you come together, therefore, into one place. When you come together into one place. See, some people haven't got that yet. When you come together into one place, and one time is assumed there. When you come together into one place, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper. For an eating, well, they thought they were eating the Lord's Supper. For an eating, everyone taketh before other his own supper. It's like a potluck. And it, that potluck became the main feature. Of course, I know none of you are familiar with something like that, but or maybe you are. One is hungry and another is drunken. What? Have ye not houses to eat and drink in, or despise ye the church of God? How's that for a statement? Yeah. Uh -huh. Do you despise the church of God? Well, I don't despise the church of God. Well, if you're unmindful of the people, you do despise the church of God. And shame them that have not. See, a poor believer came in among us that didn't have anything to could put on the table. We had our dinner and didn't have anything to put on the table. Or maybe you didn't like what they put on the table. So you didn't you didn't eat any part of it or anything like that. So it was shame. That was shame of them. So this was happening in the Corinth. They, people that didn't have uh, very much, they were, they were ashamed. When they came to their joint meal, they were, made them ashamed. It should have been a great advantage to them, but it gave them a shame. What shall I say to you? <laughs> it's, just, it's hard to talk to you, Corinthians. What shall I say? Should I praise you in this? I praise you not. Oh, let's put it down and uh, reduce it down to, so people can understand it. I don't care how many people attended. I don't care how big the offering was. I don't care how many people you entertained in your place because of the tornado. They got to say it like but people can understand. That's how, that's how Paul, I don't praise you for this. I don't praise you because you got a new auditorium. See, this is pretty, pretty pertinent. 
I don't praise you because you have a big staff. I, I don't praise you because you offer counseling services. It's, it's put, i got to put it down now where people are at here. Let's look at the Corinthian situation because it's a very strong words. I don't praise you. I mean, I'm not telling the other brethren of the other churches I write, I'm not mentioning you to them. I write you, I, I mentioned some other Macedonian brethren. I, I told you about the Macedonian brethren, but I didn't tell our Macedonian brethren about you. Let's look at the Corinthian situation. <coughs> now all this is going to relate to the Lord's table. <coughs> Contrary to the idea of, of a body, they had divisions among them, which destroys the idea of a body. If there are divisions, there's no body. Here's what he said. I beseech you, brethren, by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, you all speak the same thing. That there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and the same judgment, brethren, as a body should be. That's how you expect your body to be, isn't it? When your body's not harmonious, everything's not working together, you do something's wrong, you go to try and get the thing fixed. Yeah, yeah, amen. Well, Christ has a body. That's right. It's to be harmonious, working together. First Corinthians 3 3, you're yet carnal. You are yet carnal. <laughs> I say yet. I mean, it didn't really stop. You're yet carnal, for whereas there are envies and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal and walk as men? We're not surprised at this at the business world, the entertainment world, the sport world. We're not in a, a surprised at that, but in the in the church? First yeah. Corinthians eleven eighteen, the eleventh chapter is where he brings up the Lord's table. First of all, when you come together in the church, I hear that there be divisions among you, and I partly believe it. That is, I don't find this a very difficult thing to believe at all. I wonder what he would say at a church that had three services and not one of them filled up the building. Yeah, well, everyone has the right. No, they don't. No, they don't. In the body of Christ, you lose your rights. You are absorbed into a body. Now every man prefers the other. Amen. Seek another's wealth, not your own. Provide for your brethren, not for yourself. Amen. See? So he would say this a lot of places today. I hear when you come together in one place, the only way you can get along is you got to have separate services. Mm -hmm. I understand some of you don't like the music the other folk use, mm -hmm. and some of you don't like the sermons the other folk hear. Well, I partly believe it. What kind of body is that? But these churches boast of their arrangement. We've got something for everybody. We're not ashamed of it. We don't. We don't aim to have something for everybody. That's not even why we're here. We aim to have something for the people of God and aim to have a service Jesus can attend and God can attend and the Holy Spirit and angels can attend and any believer in the world feels welcome. Praise God. That's the kind of assembly we tend to have. See, Corinth didn't have it. They had this, these divisions among them. And they had a preference of preachers. They had favorite preachers they liked. And they were contentious about it. 1 Corinthians 1 12, Now this I say, that every one of you saith, I am of Paul, I am of Paulus, I am of Cephas, I have Christ. Well, of course, Jesus is the preeminent, we understand, but the rest, none of those were like bad yeah. preachers. Mm -hmm. I mean, Cephas, Paulus, Paul, mm -hmm. I kind of like the idea of having all three. That kind of, yeah. of appeals to me, but they had favorites. I said, well, frankly, we're going to when Apollos comes, we'll be sure to be there. 
If Paul's there, we, we probably will be busy. If Cephas comes, I mean, he's a Jew, we're not Jews. Only the Jewish segment of the church will probably come. See, that was serious to Paul. Yeah. And we're going to find it even in pins on the Lord's table. Pins on that. And they, uh, they were tolerant of an immoral person in their assembly. They, they tolerated the condition. I don't imagine they bragged about it and put it in the bulletin. We've got a fornicator, one of the few churches that will allow fornicators. I mean, I don't think they probably said something like that. But it was reported everybody knew about it. First Corinthians 5 1, it's reported commonly that there's a fornicate that there's fornication among you, and such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles that one should have his father's wife. And you're puffed up. <laughs> I mean, you claim you love this fellow so much. Here's where you can be loved. Yeah, amen. Here's where you can recover. Yeah. Huh? We pity the fornicators. Just making a mess out of their lives. It's going to hurt them the rest of their life. But you can be welcome here. We, we welcome everybody here. You rather should have mourned that he that have doth done this deed might be taken away from among you. I don't know many churches that mourn when they have immoral people among them. Well, I, Corinth didn't, that's for sure. And in a preference for self, kind of a self-exaltation, they actually sued one another at the law. Not because particularly they'd been wrong, but to get an extra buck. First Corinthians 6, 1. Dare any of you, having a matter against another, go to the law before the unjust and not before the saints? But some people, if they had gripe about the saints, they'd be ashamed to say it publicly. <laughs> well, I pretty much told you the story there, doesn't it? But a brother goeth to law with brother, and that before unbelievers... Now, therefore, there's utterly a fault among you because ye go to law one with another. Why do you not rather take wrong? Yeah. Why don't you just shut up and take it? Amen. Why do you not rather suffer yourselves to be defrauded? So you lost a few dollars. Yeah. Yeah. Why do nay, you do wrong and defraud, and that's your brethren? Yeah, yeah what's going on in Corinth, see? Oh, Paul would have a hard time in the churches of our day because they're even worse than Corinth. And they were inconsiderate of weaker brethren. Now, all this has to do with the Lord's table. They, had, they were inconsiderate of weaker brethren. Weaker brethren being brethren, their knowledge was smaller. They weren't like morally weak brethren. That's not because you already told you what he thinks about morally weak brethren. He, he's not talking about morally weak brethren. He's brethren weak in conscience. They just don't... It is not a clear picture to them. Some people there didn't really know there was one God. Say, so, my goodness, you mean why didn't why didn't after all that time, why didn't they know there was just one God? Well, because evidently Corinth is busy talking about some other things. Yeah. Uh -huh. So they came from an idolatrous background. And some of these people with a weak conscience, they weren't still worshiping the idol. They couldn't eat, eat meat offered to idols because they would think about the idol when they did it. But some of the Corinthian brethren just ate their steaks right under the other person's nose that they bought at the marketplace where the meat sold to idols was sold. Remember Paul told him, he said, whatever is sold in the samples, you can, you can eat it without any kind of conscience unless someone thinks you're worshiping that God. If you didn't have any other reason for not listening to Christian rock music, yeah. that's reason enough. Amen. Someone might think you're a fan of that person. I mean, you may like some of the old crooners, you know, that were adulterers and bigamists and <laughs> drunkards and... But, oh, they used to have these nice ballads they'd sing, and you may like them, and so you play them at home. But when I hear them, I'm not thinking about that ballad, because I remember these kind of people. 
So I, even if I even if I did like it, I wouldn't play it. You got to know how to apply this kind of stuff here. This goes down to even clothes you wear. You might wear kind of clothes rebels wear. Well, we don't have trouble like this, but some places do. And you might wear your hair like rebels do. See, at the scriptures, there was a certain kind of an attire a harlot wore. It was the way she fixed herself up, but people avoided looking like that. Why? Not to cause offense to other people. But they didn't have that. They didn't mind the weaker brethren. <coughs> Romans 8 and 4. As concerning, therefore, the eating of those things that are, of, are offered in sacrifices to, unto idols, we know that an idol is nothing in the world, and that there is none other God but one. But don't quite, we know that. I mean, the people I'm correcting. For though there be many that are called gods, whether in heaven or earth, as there be gods, many and lords, many too. But to us there is but one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we in him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by him. And everyone says, Amen. But he said, But there is not in every man this knowledge. Some of the people there, they don't know this yet. They're just they're too close to their exit from idolatry. They don't know this. For some with conscience of the idol to this hour eat it as a thing offered to idols, and their conscience being weak is defiled. So they think they can't eat this because of for 40 years they ate this kind of meat remembering an idol. They just can't eat it without remembering that. And they see you eat it. See, that was a strong appeal. He told him, I'd rather not eat meat while the world stood than to offend my brother. But Amen. that isn't how the Corinthians uh, thought. All this, again, is going to have to do with the Lord's table. And there were some at Corinth. <coughs> I'm laying out some of the problems at Corinth. <laughs> that doubted Paul's apostleship. They questioned he was an apostle. And they examined him like a, you would ex like the people in a, examine a, someone for the Supreme Court. They examined him to see if he's suitable. They were examining Paul to see if he passed their test. Paul said in First Corinthians nine, "Am I not an apostle? Am I not free? Have I not seen Jesus Christ our Lord? Or not Ye my work in the Lord, if I be not an apostle unto others, yea, doubtless I am to you, for the seal of my apostleship are ye in the Lord. Like I can you were converted under my ministry. Yeah. Have we not power to eat and drink? Have we not power to lead about a sister, a wife, as well as other apostles, and as the brethren of our Lord and C our Lord and Cephas? See, so some people have written were saying, Look, if you really want to serve God, you have to have a wife. Because the scripture says if a man doesn't take care of his own house, how can he take care of the house of God? And really, we're suspect about Paul because there's got to be some reason why he's not married and he'd be a lot better if he was married. In fact, I've heard yeah. preachers say this, that Paul would have been more effective if he'd been married. I hope they're out of the ministry now, but that, that's just true. So he had to deal with that and had to defend the fact that he was an apostle. And there was, uh, again, I'm going to connect all this with the table. <laughs> again, there was a lack of order in their assembly. He had to remind them when you let all things be done decently now and in order when you come together. Let's not have helter-skelter in the assembly. It's, Let's all be headed in the same direction. Let's all be working so it's coming, coming together, so that so that Christ is accentuated. If if any, if you come in with different things, that been brethren, when you come together, one is a psalm, one is a doctrine, one is a tongue, and a revelation, interpretation. Let all things be done and edifying. Uh, see, we personally have experienced this that, and I I think this is increasing that, without meeting together and planning together, things kind of. Why is that? Because we're meeting to edify. Amen. That's why it's that way. Yeah. So, well, but how does it work out like that? Well, when you when you have this purpose, which is a divinely established purpose, yeah. then Christ enters in right. to the people who are doing the preparing, and He's the one that orchestrates it all Amen. together. Now, then, we're down to our text. <laughs> <coughs> <coughs> 
When you come together, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper. Let me uh, interpolate here a little bit. What Paul says, I can tell by what's going on that you haven't come together to eat the Lord's table. But it's even stronger than that. When you come together, therefore, into one place, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper. And I want to give you some alternate readings about this because some, they, some of them are true. It's not the supper instituted by the Lord that you eat. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's strong. <laughs> Here's the American standard. It's not possible to eat the Lord's Supper. That's a very conservative version. Here's the basic Bible English. It's not possible to take the holy meal of the Lord. That's when you come together. Here's Holman's Standard Bible. It's not really to eat the Lord's Supper. Here's the English Standard Version. It's not the Lord's Supper that you eat. Here's God's Word Bible. You can't possibly be eating the Lord's Supper. Now, those are strong words. And that's what the text means. You're not doesn't mean you haven't purposed to eat the Lord's table because they had purposed to eat it. But it was after their own meal. So the meaning of the text is, in your condition, God will not let you eat at this table. Yeah, that's too strong. You cannot, yeah, that's right. well, you remember, I don't have to quote it. You remember the text, don't you? You cannot eat at the table of devils and at the table of the Lord. You, that's what he's talking about here. Your conduct has disqualified you from the Lord's table. Then God, he's going to judge you because you didn't eat the Lord's table. Yeah, so you, you can't say, well, all right, we'll just wait till we get things straightened out. Then we'll eat it. No, no, you got like a second to straighten it out. As soon as you know something is wrong in your life, you just got a few minutes to make it right. Amen. And it's chiefly going to have to do with resolve and determination and by God's grace I will and it, that sort of thing. But if you do that, you'll be successful. Because the arm of the Lord's strong. This is not, oh, it's so potent. I, I tell you, I'm almost fear and tremble. Just to read the words, self and personal interests dominated their assembly. I showed you already what they did in their assembly. There was competition. There was confusion. There, there was a lack of edification. There was a lack of consideration. And so they, they actually, personal preferences trumped what they were doing, which itself disqualified them from eating at the Lord's Supper. Amen. Strong stuff. They were, let's get, break it down further. They were living in contradiction of the cross. Yeah. Yeah. See, the cross of Christ is the pivot on which everything turns. The cross of Christ, that's where the law was taken out of the way. The cross of Christ, that's where the sins were taken away. See, everything pivots in the cross. So you cannot be associated with the cross of Christ and have a dominating self-interest. This is not, it can't be done. Amen. You may try and do it, so what, that's why some of them were judged. They kept on eating at the Lord's table, choosing their personal preference, and God caused some of them to die and some of them to get sick in a sanctified effort to wake them up. But see, there's been such a disassociation of this table with Christ and this table with God that people sit at it and they don't actually make a conscious connection between this table and the Christ they're supposed to be remembering. And the God who sees it because he's very sensitive about our attitude toward his son. And at this table... If what you want is more important than what God wants, God, God won't recognize that you even sat at this table, and the fact that you made an attempt to do so will call forth his judgment. 
Now we're saved by keeping the gospel in memory. That's the 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians and verse 1. I, you preach the gospel to him again. He says, I'm going to preach the gospel to you again now. The gospel I already preached it, but I'm going to preach it to you again. The gospel by which you're saved, if, if, if you keep it in memory. Now we're at the table now. <laughs> this, is, this is the divinely ordained activity that keeps it in memory. That's why it's wrong to have a Lord's table meditation about, you know, human duty or some other such thing. Now let's look at this. The, <coughs> the Corinthians had missed the point of their assembly. He wanted to get them on the right track. He said, now I'm going to show it to you. First of all, I'm going to say, whatever you do, do it for the edification of the body. But I'm going to show, yet I'm going to show you a more excellent way. Yeah. Then he inserts chapter 13. Yeah. After he has talked about the gifts, which were dominant, they didn't come behind any gift, and it was like a, it was like a spiritual circus. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The Corinthian assembly, with all these gifts operating, see? And so he... Uh, He says, I'm going to show you a more excellent way now, love. That's the more excellent way. If you can love the brethren, you'll do the right thing. Yeah. Trouble down there in Corinth is you don't love one another. You're too easily provoked. You're seeking your own interest, et cetera, et cetera. And God won't let you eat at this table with that kind of a mindset. So it doesn't seem right. I think if I could just come to the table, I could correct my thinking. No, you come to the table, but judge yourself. Get that, get that straightened out. You got the time it takes to start this, the passion of this, till it gets to you to do it. You say, well, that's, I don't know if I can. Well, don't, just not forget to throw Christ into the equation here. Amen. Yes, you can. You can. You may not have walked all your whole life, but you can, at a word from God, pick up your bed and walk. Amen. Amen. You can do this. Oh, yes, it can be correct. You may have lived in this condition for 39 years. And it can be resolved between the time it takes to say a prayer here to when they get back to you, and it can be all resolved. Amen. Amen. That's what we're encouraging people to do, and that's what he's encouraging them to do, see? I'm showing you a more excellent way. And where uh, the way of love, where, where is the love of God accented? <laughs> it's accented at the cross. Hereby perceive the love of God because he laid down his life for us. That's where, that's where we see it. He laid down his life uh, for us. And there's several scriptures that point this out, that the love of God was demonstrated in the death of Christ. So the cross of Christ is a gigantic confirmation Amen. of the love of God. Yeah. So that if you remember it he, and see his love, then his love will begin to work, his love begin to work in you. Uh -huh. And he'll teach you. How to love one another. Amen. Paul told the Thessalonians, you yourselves are taught of God to love one another. That's telling me they came to the table with the right mindset. Yeah. Yes, it's, it's a, <laughs> God commended his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died. For, there it is. There's the cross again, see. Walk in love as Christ also hath loved us and given himself to us, for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God. There it is again. He is at the cross. That's where the love is made known. For as much as ye know, ye were not redeemed with corruptible things of silver and gold from your vain conversation, received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without spot and without blemish. See? It's a better way. It's a better way. 
Now, correctly seen, the death of Christ becomes a constraining factor. If you can focus on the love of Christ and on the death of Christ and concentrate on it, which is not always easy to do, you'll probably have a lot of fiery darts thrown into your mind at this table. But now you got to use the shield of faith. You got to use the shield of faith. You got to come up thinking about Jesus and about His love for you. And correctly seen, the love of Christ becomes a constraining factor. Is it not written? The love of Christ constraineth us. Because we thus judge if one died for all, then all were dead. So when you come to this table, you're thinking about the cross, you're focusing on the love of God, you're seeing, then God enters into the thing, and, and the, all of a sudden that love com compels you. Yeah. It draws you into what God is doing. And suddenly you have this prevailing love for the brethren. You're not thinking about what can the brethren give me. You're thinking about what can I give the brethren. Amen. I remember when Paul said, when I had need, I didn't tell you. But when they had need, he did that, and then he communicated something to them. But 2 Corinthians 5.15 says that he died for all that they which live should not henceforth, or from that point on, live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Wherefore, henceforth, this point on, we know no man after the flesh. We don't, we don't look at one another after the flesh. Now that we've seen, yeah, uh -huh. now that we've seen what Christ did, yeah. now that we've seen what He did, those two verses are right after the love of Christ constrained us. Now that we see what He did, mm -hmm. this has changed, yeah. changed our conditions. That's why Paul was so concerned about the Corinthians. They didn't have this. They didn't have this kind of mindset. Mm -hmm. So he knew something was. Well, here's what was wrong. God wouldn't let them partake of the answer to their problem. They couldn't do it. They thought they were doing it. They went through it, went through the exercise of it, but it wrought nothing in them because God didn't, doesn't invite these kind of people to his table and he'll not permit them to eat of the sacrifice of Christ. He will not let them do it. So we have a critical uh, situation here. The death of Christ is at the heart of the gospel. <clears throat> and the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. See? Not unto initial salvation, to salvation in its entirety. When it begins to when it culminates at the coming of the Lord. The gospel is God's power all through that period Amen. from when you first believed until Jesus comes again. Amen. The gospel is the power and the Lord's table is a concentrated gospel. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's what it is. Amen. Gospel. It's a concentrated form of the gospel. And it has tremendous power, yes, working power. Now with that in mind, he said, Now I received of the Lord. That was also I delivered to you. I mean, I've told you this before. That the Lord Jesus, the same night, the same, the same night in which he was betrayed, uh, if anyone had a right to self-interest, it was Jesus. Yeah, right. I, I mean, if it, uh -huh. but the same night he's betrayed, he's thinking of his disciples. Amen. He took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, take, eat. He didn't say he ate it to strengthen himself for the suffering of the cross and build up his energy. And so he ate, oh, he ate it for that purpose. Uh -huh. He gave it to them. This is my body which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood, this do ye as often as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death, or declare the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily, 
shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. So instead of crediting you for remembering Jesus, you're credited for slaying Jesus. That's what it means. But let a man examine himself. And so, in the state of examination, let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. If you look, examine yourself and you look at yourself honestly, you'll not be coming up with wrong conclusions. Why won't you? Because the Holy Spirit will help you to search. Amen. If you're intent on doing this, if you're intent on searching your, and examining yourself, the Holy Spirit will help you. He'll, he'll help you to know what, what areas to shine the light. And so that's, that's between you and him. But you can't, you can't do what God says to do without getting the results God says you get. So when you examine yourself, see, anytime God tells you to examine or whatever he tells you to do, if you enter into it, now you've got divine help and assistance all, <laughs> all around. So for this reason, Paul preached the gospel again to them, as he said in succeeding chapters, chapter 15. <coughs> so the power of the gospel works within the framework of remembrance. If you can get remembrance into the equation, remembering Jesus we're talking about, in that context of remembering Jesus, the gospel begins to be powerful. Uh -huh. yeah. And it works things in you that need to be worked, that none of us can work on each other. Uh -huh. See? So this is like a cornerstone of the assembly it's not possible to ponder the gospel without being constrained by it. Amen. The gospel is, su is such a message, the gospel, that it cannot be perused just intellectually. You'll let go of it. it it'll, you'll, you'll drop out of the remembering. It's just that it's constructed that way. That the only way you could keep riveted on the gospel is to really remember Jesus, remember the person that's in it rather than the various components involved. Edification in its essence is godly consideration of one another. And who, brethren, has considered us more than Christ? Amen. So when you remember that, and you remember how he views this body of people with whom you sit, Jesus will give you the same mindset he's got. And there will be a lot of things resolved. When we meet to eat the Lord's table, we're doing like the disciples at Troy. As they came together on the first day of the week to break bread. That's why they came together. Well, that's not all they did because we got a record of Paul preached all through the night. So that's not all they did, but it was... The, the center post of everything they did. Right. Everything gathered around it. And we partake of the Lord's Supper when we meet on Lord's Day at the conclusion of our meetings. Now, some people do it at the beginning and so forth, and we don't, we're not making any harsh laws here. I'm just going to give my, my own thoughts on it. At the Lord's table, if you let it happen, everything will come together that went on. Yeah. And it will come together at the right place in Christ. And if you profited, you'll give the glory to the right person, yeah. Christ. Amen. And you'll be made the stronger for it because as you're able to connect everything with Christ, that's where you get the benefit. Yeah. That's one of the main ministries of this uh, this table. Brother Aaron has our exhortation.